Hello, this is Dr. Patrick Hu, current president of SITSI and president and CEO of Moffitt Cancer Center. And we are thrilled today to have an inspirational leader amongst us, Dr. Lori Glimpshire, who is president and CEO of Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and also an outstanding immunologist with a wonderful career. Uh, thank you, Dr. Glimpshire, for being with us today. It's a pleasure. Uh, tell us, you started off in immunology. Uh, what attracted you to the immune system and why is that what you ended up studying? Well, that's quite an easy question to answer. I was a first year medical student at, at, at Harvard and uh, the last block we had in the first year was immunology. It was uh, given by Dr. Kenneth Block. And I just fell in love with the immune system. I was so amazed that there could be an endogenous system that recognized self and distinguished it from foreign invaders like cancer or viruses or bacteria. But if the system went awry and became overactivated, one could develop uh, autoimmune diseases like systemic lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And that's actually what really uh, inspired me to become a researcher in immunology, but also um, uh, to dedicate myself primarily to research in immunology. You've done so many important areas of immunology from how immune cell gets activated and all the molecules involved in that, the transcription factors. Uh, tell us, um, what, what's, what are you most proud of in, in terms of your body of work? Well, I have to say that in terms of my career, what gives me the most joy are the individuals that I trained. It has been such a pleasure um, and joy to see my previous graduate students or postdoctoral fellows be successful. And, you know, when I pick up a, a science magazine um, journal and I see a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, piece of work by somebody that I've trained, it makes me feel even happier than I do when my own lab creates something. So, um, I've loved being a mentor and especially with a, a soft spot in my heart for women. What's your uh, philosophy for mentorship and how do you approach that educating the next generation? I think it's the most important thing that any senior scientist can do because that's really um, how we will be remembered and by helping to generate the next generation of superb uh, physicians, superb scientists, and physician scientists as well, which is what I am. And uh, you know, we we are trying to guarantee a bright future. What is it that we have to do to um, continue uh, to inspire young people to go into science, to inspire women to go into science, to go into leadership? Uh, what do you feel that path is? I think. Everybody needs both emotional and intellectual support. Um, you know, we all know that being a scientist, you, you got to be passionate about it, right? Because 90% of our experiments are going to fail. We're going to get our papers rejected and our grants not funded. And it takes a lot of perseverance. And you're not gonna have that perseverance unless you are passionate about the questions that you're asking that you wanna find the solutions to. So you gotta be the kind of person who, you know, while you're taking a shower or going for a run, you're thinking, what, what is the next experiment? What is the next area? And, and you have to take risk. And I, I say that all the time to my mentees. You know, you don't wanna just extend and confirm other people's work, you really, if you're going to do this as a career, you're going to need passion, you're going to need perseverance, and you're going to have to take risks. You got to ask big questions, and you you know you're going to you know there, many of them are going to fail. You, you're not you're going to going to make that discovery you hope you'd make, but you keep on because you care so much about finding the right answer. I remember uh, that in motion watching one of your lectures. Uh, you had just studied a transcription factor, made the transgenic mouse, you thought it was gonna affect immune cells. 
And lo and behold, it affected the bone. And so <laughs> you just said, all right, I'm an immunologist, but I'm going to go become a bone researcher. And you just shifted into really uh, coming into some seminal findings of bone. Was that one of the examples of uh, having the courage to go in there and take some risk and say, all right, I'm going to go do bone now? Well, I'll never forget that morning. Um, I had a graduate student, Mark Wine, and a postdoc, Dallas Jones. Um, we thought we had isolated the transcription factor that was going to drive type 1 immunity. In other words, TBET. Um, and it looked from the early experiments in terms of the distribution of, of this uh, protein, which was called Schnurri 3, that it would have an effect on the immune system. But we looked and looked, and it really did not have a dramatic effect on the immune system. And I was sitting with Mark and, and Dallas, and I said, well, you've looked at every single immune organ, right? Um, you've looked at the thymus, you've looked at lymph nodes, you've looked at the bone marrow. And Mark said, well, actually, we can't look at the bone marrow because we, we can't seem to extract any marrow from the long bones. So I said, you need to walk down the street to Boston Children's Hospital, where my dad was chief of orthopedic surgery and a skeletal biologist, so a biophysicist actually, and get an x-ray of these mice. And they looked at me like I had lost my mind. <laughs> they came running back with a film and these animals had incredibly high bone mass with beautiful morphogenically uh, correct bones. And, you know, it was such a dramatic phenotype that, we, you know, we want, said, okay, well, let's figure out what this protein is doing in osteoblasts. And that launched a whole new part of my laboratory, which was skeletal biology. And we, we focused on Schnurri 3 for a while, but we also identified other new proteins that affect uh, the um, development of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. I mean, osteoporosis is the most common disease in the world. Two out of every five women will have osteoporosis and there are not really excellent uh, treatments for it. Wow, that's just an inspirational story of how you followed the science and uh, took risks and just uh, moved uh, where you saw opportunity. You've also uh, been uh, very active in uh, trying to uh, engage public-private partnerships and trying to move uh, results from the laboratory to the clinic. In immunology now, there's been a revolution in anti-tumor immunity. So what are you, is your thoughts about where that's headed uh, and how the immune system can fight cancer? Well, as you, as you well know, um, this all started over a century ago with uh, a surgeon, Dr. William Coley, who made the observation that uh, when he removed, he was a surgeon, uh, a tumor from a patient, and I believe his first patients had sarcoma, um, he noted that if the wound got infected, the cancer sometimes didn't come back, even though it was expected to. And so he posited that there was a endogenous system in your body that fought off bacteria, but also fought off the tumor as a foreign agent. Uh, and he, he developed um, uh, bottles of these lysates from patients who had been affected. And, you know, he, he shopped them around and sometimes they worked. Uh, he had a huge, uh, a fierce, um, an enmity from this. Uh, he was, you know, nobody believed him. And, and eventually uh, these lysates, Coley's toxins, he called them, were replaced with radiation therapy and with chemotherapy. But, you know, that was over a hundred years ago. And immunologists, as you know, have worked for years and years and years to try to harness the immune system. And the breakthroughs really occurred about two decades ago and have changed the whole scene, the whole landscape of how we can activate our immune system. Jim Allison, um, Dr. Hongo, Hondo, and Gordon Freeman from Dana-Farber discovered a checkpoint blockade um, by identifying two inhibitory receptors. Jim Allison identified CTLA-4, 
and Hanjo and uh, Freeman uh, identified PD-1 and PD-L1 as a potent uh, inhibitory receptor. That being said, only about 25% of all cancer patients do respond to check block blockers. But you know, there are patients who were on death's door, whether they had melanoma or kidney cancer or liver cancer or whatever, who are still alive today thanks to checkpoint blockade. And we need to be really grateful for that, but we can't take our foot off the pedal. We really need to identify more inhibitory receptors that will take care of the other 75% of our, of our cancer patients who do not respond. And there are a number of specific cancers that have not been responsive. But I'm hopeful because, you know, for, for years, breast cancer was immune to um, immunotherapy, did not respond. And now with the addition of, a, of some new therapeutics, uh, women with triple negative breast cancer can sometimes respond to uh, immune checkpoint. And we've moved into other areas of immunotherapy aside from the checkpoint blockers. Uh, so what do you think uh, to get to that next level? Because, you know, there's been thousands of combinations with anti-PD-1 and really only a few positive, uh, some with standard chemotherapy, uh, anti-LAG3 combination for melanoma that was shown recently to be positive. So um, uh, what do you think is going to be uh, where we need to focus as an immunology a group, as an immunology field, as a society, uh, SITSI, where should we focus to try to unlock and, and get to that next level where we can get more patients with triple negative breast cancer uh, responding, for example? We should focus on fundamental basic science that arises from academic medical centers. Um, I think that we do not talk about that enough, but without fundamental science, there's nothing to translate. And uh, the pharma companies who studied the receptors that were identified in academic medical centers and look to be promising, they're all really pretty much working on the same group of receptors. And it was very disappointing. You know, mice aren't people. We know that. They're, the mouse models in cancer are not necessarily all that reliable. And so we need to continue to discover new targets. When we look at the fact that we have about 20,000 proteins in the human system, drugs have been developed against only about a thousand of those 20,000. So there's a tremendous richness out there that we haven't tapped into. And I'm happy to say that um, at Dana-Farber, we have discovered some new inhibitory receptors. Uh, they've been spun out into companies and um, are looking very promising. So we, you know, we need to support fundamental science. That's the bottom line. And um, because research is always a money losing process. We all know that. Uh, Dana-Farber actually gets more funds per faculty than any other cancer center from the National Cancer Institute. And we still have to supplement that with philanthropy. Yeah, the um, I tell you, your pan mass challenge is is the envy of every single cancer center in the nation. I can tell you. Uh, um, uh, so let's talk about that. You know, you have a very successful career. I mean, uh, um, really a legendary successful career in immunology. Member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine. Um, and then you went into administration uh, while still keeping your lab, going into uh, first at Cornell as the, the dean of the medical school, and then uh, coming back to, um, uh, to Dana-Farber as their president and CEO. So that's a lot of administrative challenges where now you do have to think about, well, how are we going to uh, fund that gap? Uh, between the researchers and, and the actual cost of everything. And so tell us about that move into more administration and what uh, prompted that. And, you know, you've really been a, a glass ceiling breaker too. You're the first 
female uh, president of the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, which is fantastic. So what prompted you to make that move? You know, I felt that I had been incredibly lucky in my career as a scientist. I never would have as a first year medical student, if you'd asked me, you know, what would my career be like? I, I, I certainly would never um, have thought that we would be so fortunate to identify some really important proteins in the immune system. Um, and I, I got to a point where I thought, you know, I have, I, I really should give back. Um, I've always spent a lot of time mentoring women uh, throughout my career, but I, I felt that we needed to focus more on uh, support, supporting the next generation of scientists and physicians, and that I could best do that if I were in a position where, frankly, I was making the decisions. It's kind of nice to be the boss sometimes. It's also a big burden, but it's nice to sometimes be able to say, you know, look, we're going to do this. And I remember it at, at Cornell, for example, when I found out that we didn't have automatic uh, suspension of tenure or we were not uh, paying for uh, maternity lead, lead or leave or, or paternity leave, and we didn't have a daycare center, I just stood up and said, we're changing all this. We're gonna have maternity and paternity leave. We're gonna build a new daycare place because our young female scientists need it. And that's just the way it's going to be. And, you know, we did it. And I looked carefully around for talent uh, in women, because we had plenty of women there and very, very few in senior positions. And I made a huge effort to, to meet with small groups many, many times to pretty much look at the entire faculty at, at Wild Cornell. There's a lot of talent there. And by the time I left, we had many women in senior uh, positions uh, and doing a, doing a great job. So that gives me great joy. I think, I think you, you shouldn't even think about being a CEO or a president unless you derive great joy from helping others. If you're at that point in your career where you really want to give back and, and that, you know, when I pick up a magazine and I see a great article from one of my trainees, it just fills me with joy. Um, and when I can raise money to support uh, one of our faculty research program, and I can say to them, look, I was able to get this for you. It just makes me so happy. Well, that's inspirational that you really went into administration to give back, to level the playing field, to bring up the next generation. It's really, uh, really fantastic. As a CEO, though, I mean, I, I know, it, you know, you say we got to do this, we got to do that, we got to do this. And then the next thing is, all right, uh, where are we going to find the money uh, to do this? And your CFO then is going to. So, so tell me about that and about what you've learned uh, in administration and leadership and and how you've uh, tried to marry those two things, being the um, uh, responsible for the next generation, new programs and others, as well as being the, the chief fundraiser really for, for your organization. I like talking to people. Um, I like explaining to lay audiences why what we do is so important. You know, the two out of every five Americans are gonna experience cancer in their lifetime, that we've made huge progress, but there's so much left to do. And you get to meet so many people, interesting people, um, when you're making the rounds uh, of philanthropy. So, uh, you know, I spend about a third of my time doing that, and I'm happy to do it. And I think a lot, so many people want to be generous, and they want to help fulfill a dream. And you know, I, I would say our philanthropists, they're just so engaged and they're so delighted to be able to move something forward that's really important to them. Sometimes it's based on personal experience of a family member or themselves. And sometimes 
they're just enchanted by the science. Uh, so I, I consider that obviously that's, that's a good part of my job, but I, I really enjoy doing it um, because we have used those funds to make advances. We really have. And what prompted you, uh, um, Lori, to come back from Cornell to Dana-Farber uh, when a lot of your career was autoimmunity, bone physiology? Um, uh, what uh, prompted you to focus now on cancer? Well, the immune system is present in virtually every single organ in the body. So I had done some work in cancer, looking at the effect of TBET in cancer and, and uh, XBP1 in cancer and so forth. So it wasn't, it wasn't a, a new field for me. Um, and actually uh, we had um, transited uh, towards cancer when I was uh, at the school at Harvard, at the, the last couple of years I was at Harvard and then my time at Wall Cornell is when we were really exploring the role of ER stress in, uh, in cancer, both at the level of the tumor and also at the tumor microenvironment. So that, you know, that fit in perfectly with, with moving to the Dana-Farber. You know, I, I had a wonderful time at um, Wall Cornell and I had expected to stay there another, for another term but it was very hard to resist the opportunity to come back to Harvard and to Dana-Farber, which is such an amazing institute. Um, so while I felt a little bit guilty leaving Wild Cornell, um, I was excited about coming back to, to Boston. And part of that, to be totally honest, were my kids. I have three grown up children, two sons and a daughter and there were gonna be grandchildren coming along. And uh, I think that the final de decision was after both of my sons who were grown up sending me a letter with a bunch of flowers saying, mom, um, we love you and we really want you to come back to Boston. <laughs> so that was it, back into Boston. And I have uh, now three grandchildren in Boston and two in Washington, D.C. They're the best, really the best. That's really wonderful. And that's another thing I've always been impressed about you and your career. You've always valued your family. I remember once you're at MD Anderson, we were giving an award and you were, uh, you know, really uh, following your son who was coming back from Afghanistan. And, and it was just, I just, I could see that you were just so focused on your family. Um, and uh, you've done that and you've um, really flourished in, in science. Uh, in medicine, uh, in uh, administration. So um, what's your secret to all that? Uh, hard work, <laughs> a balanced perspective of what is important, um, what really matters in your life. I don't have a big ego. I've never had a big ego. I mean, my, my, my philosophy is always to surround myself with people um, who are smarter than I am and who have expertise and skills that I don't have. And that's why I have a top-notch senior management team at Dana-Farber. Um, you know, there's hard work and some of it's hard work and some of it's luck. And, uh, but, you know, you, you go, go back to reality when I remember when I did get the call that I was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. I think it was Jim Allison who called me. And I was very excited and pleased. And I went dashing off uh, in my car. I hit another car because I was so excited, which wasn't great. I got home and my younger son, Jake, the one, the Marine, the Marine Corps guy, um, who's now uh, in the US house, opens the door and said, well, I, mom, how was your day? And I said, well, well, it was really pretty good. I, I got this, this award. And he said, that's nice. What's for dinner? <laughs> really, you know, brings you back to reality. Um, and that same son asked me, uh, I brought him with me to Chicago. I can't remember what it was. It was an award that I was getting. And I brought him with, he was 12. And I got off the podium and he said, Mama, I'm, I'm really kind of confused. Are you the mom who 
sings to the dog and snuggles us all up, or are you some big scientist? <laughs> and I said, well, I guess I'm both, you know? So it's, it's not easy. I'm, I don't want to pretend that it's easy to do that, um, but it's so worthwhile. And uh, my kids have turned out well, so I don't think they've been deprived. What's your advice for um, was particularly women uh, going into science today and, and, and look at Lori Glimsher and say, wow, I want to be like her one day. Uh, what's your advice for them? I guess my advice would be only do this if you are passionate about it and you really want to make a major contribution to whatever your area is. If possible, live near your parents because there's nothing like a grandparent to have around when you're traveling or when you can't get to some baseball game or whatever, you can send grandma or grandpa. Um, if all possible, be with your family, be with the extended family as much as you can. That was a huge help for me, huge help. Um, and try to keep a, a perspective on what, what's really important in your life. You can do it, you absolutely can do it, um, but there has to be passion there. And, and, you know, get as much help as you need. Don't spend your evenings, you know, folding sheets and being worried if there's too much laundry left or the, the, the baths need cleaning, hire somebody to do that if you can. Just, you know, people ask me, and ask me, used to ask me, oh, what are my hobbies? And I said, well, I really, you know, I like gardening and I, I run and so on, but I, I really don't have hobbies because I don't have time. It's either the family or the science. And what do you do? You know, there's a lot of pressure being cancer center director with changing health care, <clears throat> always looking at funding and budgets. What, what do you do to to relieve that pressure? Well, I, I've always liked a steep learning curve. Um, I like learning new things. I've, I've served on um, uh, the boards of Bristol Myers Squibb the Waters Company, and I'm now on the board of directors at GSK and Analog Devices. I've learned a tremendous amount from being on the audit committees, the compensation committee, the governance committee. committee. So I, I felt that that really prepared me um, to move to be the, the dean at Cornell or, or the CEO at Dana-Farber. Um, but I do remember my first few weeks at Weill Cornell and, you know, I, I was not a typical choice to be the dean of a medical school. Um, I was a fundamental scientist. I had turned down many invitations to become chair of medicine or chair of this or that. And I never even pursued them because I just loved being in my lab. So it was like drinking from a fire hose. Um, you know, honestly, I barely knew what an RVU was. I was an unusual choice. For, to, to be dean and you know it took a while to make it clear that I admired our clinicians and and their work at the bedside just as much as I admired our researchers because I feel that way my older son is a cardiothoracic surgeon at Mass General and you know I have just the greatest respect for those physicians who take care of our patients yeah, I know um, uh, as cancer center directors, we collaborated recently on a goals of care, a paper that, that we put out together. Uh, that's one of the challenges of cancer centers. And um, what are other challenges that you think that we're going to be facing? You know, healthcare is changing, how we're getting compensated for the healthcare is con continually changing. Uh, um, and so what, uh, you know, the academic medical center, I think, is uh, have some threats uh, moving forward. And, and this really important area where we're generating the ideas, translating the science, has some threats on the horizon. What do you think the major ones are and how do you think we should tackle those? Well, academic medical schools uh, and centers are really under, under uh, difficult conditions now. And I worry about the future. 
I wouldn't be surprised if we lost a number of the academic medical centers. Medical research is increasingly expensive to do, and it has not in the kept pace with inflation. So as I said earlier, you know, we can't, we, we, we could not survive as the kind of, you know, very research oriented uh, hospital that we are without philanthropy. Um, there are clearly pressures um, on reimbursement from commercial insurers. Massachusetts, of course, was the state that first um, developed uh, Romney Care. And we're proud that, you know, 90 some percent of uh, Massachusetts uh, residents have paid, have insurance for health care. Um, at the same time, um, the commercial payers in Massachusetts have lower rates of reimbursement um, than most other states. I believe Massachusetts and Maryland are the two who have um, a caps on how much the increase can be from year to year in total healthcare costs. So this is, this is difficult. And, and one of the things I did when I came in first was to think, okay, how can we increase our revenue at Dana-Farber? Um, and part of that was increasing our patient volume and putting and uh, putting out satellites, which also was important to us because we wanted to serve underserved communities. We just opened one in Merrimack Valley, which is a very diverse uh, community. And we have a new alliance with Boston Medical Center where we've removed the financial barriers for patients to come to Dana-Farber because we've joined their healthcare net. Um, so this is a very, very big priority at, at Dana-Farber um, as well. And we have committed a very big chunk of philanthropy to achieving racial equity and making sure that uh, people from uh, historically underserved communities get the same quality of cancer care that everybody else does. So, there are, a number, you know, this is a tough time. It, this, without doubt, it's a tough time. And I, I can't say that, that we are wallowing in, in um, our uh, reimbursement funds, but we've become even more innovative than we were before. So we founded over 50 companies in the last decade. We have our fingerprints all over close to half of the cancer drugs approved by the FDA in the last decade. And we're looking for international, national relationships um, that can increase our revenue and also help serve people from communities that, or, or states that don't have the quality of cancer care that we have in the um, dedicated cancer centers, the 11 dedicated cancer centers, of course, um, MD Anderson is, is, is the biggest of those. Well, those are very important initiatives. I think the fact that you can just put someone's zip code in who has cancer and can figure out what their outcome is going to be is really not okay. And so I think it's wonderful that you're, you're doing that while also addressing in a creative way the challenges that all academic centers are starting to have and will continue to have in the future. And I agree with you. Some, they're, <clears throat> they're all not going to survive. And, and so, uh, and, and the ones that will survive are going to be extremely innovative and creative in their approaches. Uh, so that's that's wonderful. We're so happy that you joined Sitsi. Thanks for joining our society. And uh, this November, our meeting is going to be guess where? Uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Yes. So it, it's going to be a ton of fun. Are you planning to come to Sitsi uh, this year in Boston? Well, t let me know when what the days are. Make yeah. sure that I'm in town. Yeah, we would love to have you have you yeah. there. Um, yeah, this has been incredibly enlightening. You're an inspirational leader, uh, able to do so many things, uh, so many things at a very high level. Um, uh, Dr. Glimpshire, is there anything else that you'd like to, to add? No, just thank you for letting me uh, share my thoughts. Uh, it was fun. All right, well, yeah. thank you very much uh, for being thank here. You I know you're very busy. I really appreciate the time.
Thank you. Thank you.